Hello and welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. I'll be one of your hosts this evening. I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, and I'm joined tonight by Julie Tomei and a special guest, uh, Nelson Nunes, who will be actually talking uh, about a very interesting paper that's come out recently, and that will be a little bit later in our show. For tonight, we are broadcasting live from the LNI Carswell Observatory, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. As a reminder, York Universe broadcasts every Monday night at 9 p.m. local Toronto time, or Tuesday morning at about 2 a.m. UT, if that's more your speed. The York Universe production works in concert with our online public viewing program run by our amazing observatory team, which runs at the exact same time between the hours of 9 to 10 p.m. local Toronto time. If you'd like to find out more about the program or if you're not joining us live and just want to see more about what we do, you can always find our all of our information on our website, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. If you're trying to get back to OPV online public viewing, just follow the links to OPV or any YouTube link and that will take you directly to our channel. If you have any questions or comments or past shows or suggestions for future topics, you can always email us at observe at yorku.ca. And of course you can find us on social media, on Twitter with York Observatory uh, or um, York Universe, actually, as well, and on Instagram, York U Observatory, and Facebook at LNI Carswell Obs, just in case you like the variety. All of our programs are free, but if you do feel motivated to make a donation, you can see that same website from before, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. Our observatory crew right now is actually monitoring the chat room on YouTube live. So again, if you are joining us live, feel free to ask them questions. Our crew will be posting content and telling you all about the interesting images that they're showing on the screen. Uh, for right now though, the current weather is a bit hit and miss here in, uh, in Toronto. It's a bit cloudy over the observatory at the moment. Um, Julie, how's it where you are right now? Well, I had to go stick my head out the door uh, because the computer widget said clear, my phone said cloudy, and it turns out the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, so I, I was able to spy a few stars in Jupiter, um, but there are a few clouds on the horizon. So hit, hit and miss, as, as, as they say. <laughs> and our, our special guest tonight, uh, Nelson Nunes, he's a PhD student at York University, joining us uh, for all kinds of fun. Um, how is the uh, skies where you are, Nelson? Well, uh, notwithstanding the always massive amounts of light pollution, uh, it seems, uh, you know, I can also see a few stars and, and Jupiter out there. So uh, I don't know, maybe afterwards, I'll get my binoculars and go out there and do some observing tonight. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Uh, just as a reminder for any of our listeners out there, Jupiter is a fabulous target, um, especially right now, it's extremely bright. It's at about magnitude of minus 2.7, which is very, very bright in astronomical terms. You will have no problem seeing it, even if the light pollution is out and your skies are a bit hazy. I mean, obviously it's a lot better without the light pollution, but um, it is bright enough to put on a pretty good show for the next few nights, actually. Um, if your skies are a little clearer, you might actually be able to make out Saturn as well. Uh, so Jupiter is kind of right now in the uh, southeast and Saturn is a little bit more just past south over towards slightly southwest of um, south, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit dimmer. So Saturn is uh, 0 0.79, which is still fairly bright. You can see it with your naked eye, depending on how many bright streetlights you have around your neighborhood in Toronto. <laughs> Um, but yes, it's a, it's a hit and miss very, very much this time of year in Toronto. We have had the hugest string of cloudy nights um, a few weeks ago. I think from probably October 29th through November 10th, we had maybe one or two clear nights. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely uh, one of the worst cloudy breaks I saw. Um, so hopefully we get some new clearing happening and uh, some of that crisp winter air shakes the clouds out, uh, ideally. We can only hope. 
<laughs> very much, very much so. And so this show tonight, we're going to do a little bit uh, differently, as you may guess, with a special guest speaker. We have um, a second segment that's going to be more of a guest talk, but we're still start off with a few This Week in Space and Astronomy history. Um, we have a couple interesting items that kind of, well, maybe not directly lead into, but sort of uh, get us launched off to a good start, if I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, Julie, you have the first one. Uh, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Sure. So we're going to start on November 9th, 1972, uh, with the launch of Anik A-1. Uh, and Anik A-1 was the first of a series of geostationary communication satellites launched for Telsat Canada. Um, it was uh, for television, voice, and data comms uh, in Canada and other parts of the world. Um, and it was in service for nearly a decade. It was retired in July of 1982 and put into a graveyard orbit. Um, so as many of our listeners may know, uh, most things, most satellites don't actually come back down. They just kind of get put into an orbit where it's out of the way. We hope. Um, <laughs> we hope, <laughs> yes. Um there are currently uh, five uh, satellites in sort of the, the later ANIC um, series still in operation. The name ANIC uh, was a result of a national contest that was won by Julie France uh, Xapla of Saint Léonard, Quebec, and it means little brother in Inuktitut. Uh, the Anik A satellites, which were the first three of the series, were the world's first uh, national domestic satellites. Um, so before that, um, all geosynchronous communication satellites were transcontinental. And it gave CBC the ability to reach northern Canada for the first time. So um, you know, especially in remote or rural areas, CBC, television, uh, kind of a staple uh, for folks growing up there. Uh, it had the uh, capacity for 12 color TV channels. Three were for the CBC, two for uh, the TCTS, which was the, uh, the Trans-Canada Telephone System and uh, two as well for the uh, CNCP telecommunications, which was the Canadian National Canadian Pacific Telecommunications, two for Bell Canada, one for Canadian Overseas Telecommunications, two were on reserve and two were unallocated. So there was one called Canadian National Canadian? Canadian National <laughs> Canadian Pacific <laughs> Telecommunications. Which, okay, no, just, just checking. I'm when I hear Canadian National forced... and Canadian Pacific, I think of railways, not but, telecommunications. Yeah, like you could put maybe a, a third Canadian on there just to round it off. Canadian mm. National, Canadian Pacific Canadian. And then you, it's like a Canadian telecommunication sandwich. I love how it's not just astronomers who are bad at naming things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they just wanted to be like, really sure that you would know that it was a Canadian country. And you know, rightly so, though, because, <laughs> I mean, um, communication in 1972 was a massive deal. And there, there are still some parts of the world that do not have the ability to get good radio um, or communication signals. And it actually is a real game changer for your whole community if you get to know what's going on. Um, even if it's just a, a radio station or a, um, in this case, a satellite satellite broadcast. Um, so having that is, is pretty awesome. And the ANIC uh, A1, this is also, it's 1972. So it's a little bit interesting in terms of like the, um, the context because we're looking at launches now where we're seeing, <laughs> I forget how many thousands of Starlink satellites we're up to now, um, but it used to be very, very challenging to get any satellite in orbit um, for your own personal region. And so that having one for Canada was a pretty big deal. Yeah. And the uh, the launch that they used was, um, I believe that was the, the Delta 1000 series. Um, which is interesting because when we talk about launches, 
uh, there's expendable launch systems and there's also reusable launch systems. And the expendable ones uh, were way, way more common at this time. And the whole uh, Delta family of rockets that would have been responsible for this were so much more, I want to say the word inefficient, but they, they use so much more materials and fuel um, and resources than what we need to use now for the same weight uh, on things like, uh, of course, the, uh, the reusable um, the reusable capacity rockets like SpaceX. So it's, it's an interesting point in history for sure. Mm -hmm, absolutely. The other thing that I've always thought was amazing about the ANIC program is that it reminds us that even though Canada today doesn't seem like a leader in space, back at that time, Canada was. Uh, Canada launched only, was only the third country in the world to launch a satellite into space with Alouette. And, and these pioneering uh, communication satellites that, uh, that we put up there really uh, made a big uh, impact uh, on this field. So it reminds us that uh, even small countries, well, big geographically, which is why this was important to us, but small in population, even small countries can, can make a difference. Absolutely. And it's one of the things that's kind of nice that we're seeing now is a sort of a new explosion in uh, countries that now can have um, satellite communication, which is um, yeah, pretty cool in and of itself. Uh, all right, so I think speaking of satellites, <laughs> um, I'm just going to really quickly give a, a small shout out to a satellite that we are definitely going to talk about again. Um, so I wanted to mention a special shout out to uh, Radio Astron. And I looked around in November and <laughs> it turns out on the 20th of November in, uh, in 2017, um, the Radio Astron, which uh, we will be talking a lot more about this, um, about this later, but the Radio Astron program is an international network of observatories led by the, um, the Astro Space Center, I believe, uh, has a lot of capacity, a lot of, um, you know, different things it can do. Uh, but in November, if, let's see if I have it still here. Yeah, November of 2017, it was actually, you know, right on its uh, sort of prime uh, prime lifetime, I guess. But it was taking tons and tons of proposals and it had just finished its operations for the, uh, the hydrogen maser. Um, so it had actually switched to a backup synchronization mode. It had just exhausted all of its neutral hydrogen, which was sort of expected um, with its uh, lifetime you don't get so much hydrogen that you can you can burn before it's gone i guess and um they had been working on other types of um of, of synchronization to actually use the the radio astron satellite and i thought it was a little fun is um you know in use as of 2017 of course it did then later join what uh julie mentioned before the um the uh, unfortunate uh, graveyard of satellites um, because it lost its, um, it did eventually lose its ability to, uh, to communicate. And um, the last communication that I was able to find with the, the Spectre R satellite uh, for Radio Astron was in 2019. And um, that was sort of the, uh, the last of the Radio Astron observing program. So if you do go on their website, you won't find any news updates after about 30th of May, 2019. Um, so it's a fun little, uh, fun, well, little, not, not <laughs> a little, quite, quite large project. Uh, and as I say, we will be talking about it quite a bit more when we get to, um, to your uh, news item or uh, slash talk. Um, but, uh, and Nelson, I'm sure will tell us more about that, but I thought it would be fun to leave in here with all of our talk about satellite launches and of course, ANIC uh, A1. Um, it was actually 20th of November, 2017. It sent off all kinds of interesting, interesting updates <laughs> and it had just uh, finished its um, uh, six years of performance milestone. So I'll go ahead and round that off, uh, round that off there with the plan to come back to Radio Astron, I think. Yes. Absolutely. 
Now, next up, we have one more launch for this week in space and astronomy history. Um, and Julie, why don't you take us away to, I believe it's STS-5? Yes. So November 11th, 1982, and the launch of STS-5. This is the fifth space shuttle mission and the fifth flight for the space shuttle Columbia. The mission lasted five days, uh, landing on November 16th. It was the first shuttle mission to deploy uh, communication satellites and the first uh, that was officially operational um, of the space shuttle missions. There was a crew of four, which up until that date was the largest crew for a space shuttle. Um, and I mean, the crews for space shuttles would eventually go up to seven, but they were working up to that. Um, and there were two commercial uh, communication satellites that were the payload and were successfully placed into geosynchronous orbits. Uh, the satellites were the SBS-3 owned by Satellite Business Systems and Anik C-3 owned by Telsat Canada. Uh, it also carried a West German sponsored microgravity uh, gateway special exper experiment canister and the crew conducted three student designed experiments. Uh, there was supposed to be an EVA uh, performed. It would have been the first for the space shuttle program, um, but it wound up being canceled because of uh, issues with the spacesuits. Hmm. That does sound a little bit. Uh, um, that, that that does sound a little bit of a reason to cancel your. It's a, it's uh, your a good EVA. reason to cancel yeah. your EVA. Yeah. yeah. And of course, it has a wonderful, uh, you know, Canadian connection back with Anik. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. It was like two Anik stories. Why not? Well, and it is it is worth remembering that although I think you know um, some people uh, sort of downplay the Canadian space uh, contribution. It has actually there have been some really really awesome stuff that has happened and is happening in space. Um, oh, and of absolutely. course, you know, we have a, a new Canadian astronaut going up, <laughs> we hope soon. So it's, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty fun time to be doing space stuff in Canada. Yeah. And I think, you know, because we're a smaller country population wise, and that ends up giving us, you know, less budget. Um, but I think something know, that... I think something that Canada has done well is finding areas to specialize in and doing them really, really well. Exactly. So in the case of the space shuttle program, of course, we think about the Canada arm. Now, I, I don't think that for STS-5, the Canada arm had yet been installed, but I know in later missions, the Canada arm was even used to capture a malfunctioning satellite and, and fix it, not to mention the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, well, the whole lunar, even the lunar gateway is absolutely counting on, you know, Canada arm, basically. And that that technology, it has become incredibly important to our operations now and future plans. Yeah, exactly. We focused in on a couple of areas and got really, really good at it. Robotics, check. And <laughs> the other one was also, um, you know, medicine in space we've had you know a couple astronauts who are medical doctors and um have done a lot of studies in that in that area as well um yeah so small but mighty i mean you can even go as far as saying that uh, canada built the international space station i think that we can say that we're a <laughs> <laughs> this is a canadian program after all um and uh we uh, I do want to see um uh you know some of the uh the extra um canadian tie-ins of course um we do have the uh, one of the patches that um went up with um uh um uh, mclean nice um framed on the wall actually <laughs> so uh but yes and uh it, you know it, it's it's absolutely worth worth keeping your your thumb on thumb on the space uh in Canada right now there's just so much exciting things going on it's it's actually rather challenging to track which is a, a good problem to have yes 
All right, so let me go ahead and just do a couple small uh, reminders um, for anyone who is uh, who is listening live. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we have officially at the LNI Carswell Observatory switched into winter mode. And that means that if you would like to go on a live tour of the observatory on one of our tour Wednesdays, the sunset is now quite early. So we actually are starting live tours now at 5.30 p.m. Um, very, very early, all things considering. And we're only doing tours in the observatory proper. So if you have a special love for the top of the Arboretum parking garage, which is our atrium location, uh, unfortunately, that will be closed until uh, it starts to become warmer in Toronto <laughs> because it's open air and it is uh, very, very, very cold out there. Um, so we will be doing our regular Wednesday tour uh, this week, that is November 15th, on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If anybody wants to get tickets, they're on that same website I mentioned before. And since I did mention the website, uh, this is actually a good time to just go ahead and, uh, you know, sort of first half middle, I'll do this, I'll do the reminder um, that you are in fact listening to York Universe, broadcasting live from the LNA Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. That website, if you are interested in getting the Wednesday night in-person tour free tickets, is yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. And we have all kinds of resources on there for observers and for uh, just astronomy fans in general. The tickets are all free, but please be advised as a second update we have actually moved off of Eventbrite onto a site called Zephy. So you will still be able to get your free tickets, but you do need to go through the website and not onto Eventbrite because they're not there anymore. Um, Eventbrite has, uh, has had done some interesting things. It makes it very hard to use them. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> tonight uh, we've got a great show lined up for you. Um, you are listening to Dr. Elena Hyde, uh, Julie Tomei, and our special guest, uh, Nelson Nunes, who is um, actually a perfect opportunity here to finish my, my introduction. So first of all, um, Nelson, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. It's great to have you here. This is your first time on York Universe. Yes, it is. Oh, awesome. Well, it's great to have a, a new um, voice on the air, shall I say. Uh, and now just to make sure our listeners all know who you are, uh, Nelson Nunes is a PhD student at York University. So um, he's just around the corner from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. <laughs> um, he actually studies gravity using techniques borrowed from radio astronomy. His interest in astronomy in all things space actually started at a very young age. Um, and he attained a Bachelor of Science in the 90s and apparently had some pretty cool fame uh, at a marketing firm, which he later sold. So it's the internet, the internet wave, as I say, and he credits his background in, for science, his science background as a, as, dri as a driver for success. Um, it's, uh, he's a father of three and loves hiking and exploring. So we should definitely tell you about the... Um, astronomer in residence program at some point yes <laughs> because i think you will love it mm -hmm. um but i actually I actually attended it last year it's amazing oh well then uh, um glad to hear if uh, anybody <laughs> doesn't know the astronomer in residence program for 2023 is closed uh 2024 will open in the end of uh, January. But tonight we actually have a um, pretty fun little um, talk here because uh, Nelson, you were the lead on a paper um, that was uh, really interesting. And I know it's been out for a few weeks, but it verifies Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, and this is cool because obviously we love a confirmation measurement, at least I think I, I speak for all scientists. I <laughs> love a confirmation measurement, but you did it in a very, very interesting way. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you uh, to tell us a little bit about, about your measurement. Well, excellent. 
Uh, thank you for having me on the show today and giving me an opportunity to describe the work that I've been doing, along with Professor Norbert Bartel, who's a distinguished research professor emeritus here at York, and Michael Beatenholtz, a senior researcher also here at York. We also have a team of international collaborators working with us. Together, we're making high precision measurements of an effect called the gravitational redshift. And we're doing this to test Einstein's equivalence principle, which lies at the heart of his theory of general relativity. And we do this by observing signals from the spacecraft you mentioned, radio astron, which is in an orbit. It may no longer be functioning, but it's still up there. And it's in an orbit that uh, goes from a couple of thousand kilometers uh, away from Earth to as far as the distance of the moon. Now to set the stage for understanding what we're doing, we need to go back to the first decade of the 1900s and understand a little of what was going on in Einstein's head at the time. He had just published the theory of special relativity that explained why the speed of light always appears constant. In that theory, inertial motion or constant velocity motion plays a key role. But why would this type of motion be so special? This bothered Einstein. He was also greatly bothered by the role of mass in Newton's laws of motion and gravity. If you think of the force required to move an object, obviously heavier objects require more force. So motion relates to mass, and we call this type of mass inertial mass. Since Galileo's time, we've also known that objects fall at the same rate no matter their mass. This means that gravity pulls on objects with a force that is also related to their gravitational mass. But why should these two masses be the same? Aren't the two effects completely different? Why should the same mass appear in our equations for both effects? Einstein decided this was unlikely to be a coincidence, so he postulated that the two masses were in fact equivalent. With that key insight, and a desire to develop a theory that encompassed gravity in all forms of motion, including accelerated motion. And after eight years of hard work, he successfully developed the theory of general relativity, which describes all motion and gravity under one consistent picture. This was his crowning achievement and made him one of, if not the most famous scientist of all time. But his insight went further than just mass equivalence. He also postulated that gravity and acceleration should be equivalent. To understand what that means, let's imagine either being in a sealed room resting on the surface of the earth or being in the same room on a rocket accelerating at a constant rate. Let's assume that that rocket is moving very smoothly and there's no noises or vibrations that will allow us to know which room we're in. Einstein's equivalence principle says that no matter how hard we try, we can't construct an experiment that would be able to distinguish between these two situations, certainly not from within the room. One immediate consequence of this principle is the existence of a gravitational redshift. To understand what this is, let's consider something that should be more familiar, the Doppler effect. So that's when a car speeds by you, you hear a vroom sound. When the car is moving towards you, the sound's pitch goes higher. And when the car speeds away, it gets lower. This happens because the car's motion affects the sound waves you hear. We see the Doppler effect in more than just sound. In fact, it applies to anything that oscillates, including light and radio signals, in which we see the frequency or how fast the signal is oscillating being affected by relative motion. This is how radar works by measuring frequency shifts and using our knowledge of the Doppler effect to determine how fast objects are moving. So if motion leads to a Doppler effect, by Einstein's equivalence principle, gravity should lead to something similar. And it does, and we call that the gravitational redshift. Basically, the frequency of a signal transmitted from one place will appear shifted when observing it from another place where the strength of the gravitational field is different. An example would be observing here on Earth the frequency shift of a signal from a spacecraft far away where the Earth's gravity is much weaker. This is exactly what we do with radio astron. Now you might be wondering what gives rise to the gravitational redshift. With the Doppler effect, it's the distance getting smaller or larger that causes the effect. So it's space related. With 
gravitational redshift, it's the effect of gravity on time itself that gives rise to the effect. So when we're measuring the gravitational redshift, we're, we're actually measuring how gravity slows down time on Earth compared to the rate at which it passes far away. Anyway, coming back to Radio Astron, as was mentioned before, the spacecraft was launched in 2011 with a 10 meter dish on board to observe the sky at radio wavelengths, just like Hubble and James Webb telescopes, but for a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Luckily for us, the spacecraft also included a very precise atomic clock called the hydrogen maser, which Dr. Hyde mentioned. Using signals timed to that very precise clock, we were able to see how time on board the spacecraft was affected by its motion through the Earth's gravitational field. In principle, that sounds simple, but in practice, there's a major hurdle that needs to be overcome in this type of experiment. And that's the fact that we see both the Doppler effect and the gravitational redshift at the same time. To measure just the gravitational redshift, we need to subtract the Doppler effect, but doing so directly requires knowing exactly how fast, or at least very precisely how fast the spacecraft is moving. And unfortunately, we can't do that accurately enough. Instead, we use a clever technique first used in the 1970s on a similar experiment called Gravity Probe A. It relies on the fact that the two effects, the gravitational redshift and the Doppler effect, behave differently depending on which way the signal is going. For the Doppler effect, direction doesn't matter. All that matters is whether the transmitter and the receiver are moving towards or away from each other. It's about the relative motion. So you get the same Doppler shift if the signal's coming from the spacecraft and being observed on Earth, or whether a station on Earth transmits a signal up to the spacecraft. Okay, on the other hand, the direction the signal is going matters for the gravitational redshift. For the signal sent from the spacecraft to the ground, the signal will be shifted to higher frequencies, while the signal from the ground to the spacecraft will be shifted to lower frequencies. Now here's the clever bit. A signal sent from the ground to the spacecraft that is then retransmitted back to the ground will have no net gravitational redshift as the effect on the way up cancels the effect on the way down. But the Doppler on the other hand, will be the same either way, so it's doubled. We call this a two-way signal because it's going from the ground to the spacecraft and back to the ground. And that's in contrast to a one-way signal which originates at the spacecraft and is just observed on the ground. That one-way signal will have both the Doppler effect and the gravitational redshift. By combining the two signals, we can cancel out the Doppler effect while retaining just the gravitational redshift. And that's how we perform our experiment accurately enough to measure the gravitational redshift, despite it being 10,000 times smaller than the Doppler effect experienced by the spacecraft. As Dr. Hyde mentioned, recently we published our preliminary results where we found that the gravitational redshift predicted by general relativity matches what we see in the signal from radio astron to one part in a hundred trillion. If you were keeping time that precisely, you would only lose one second every 30 million years. Crazy, right? And we found this to be true both when the spacecraft was relatively close to the Earth, so near the distance of the GPS satellites and the geostationary communication satellites we were talking about earlier, but also when the spacecraft was far from Earth, around 350,000 kilometers, which is almost as far as the orbit of the moon. Now you might be wondering, why does any of this matter? Why go through all this effort to confirm general relativity when it's been around for over a hundred years and is one of the most well-tested theories in physics? Well, we have a problem in fundamental physics that some of you may have heard of. And that's that our two most fundamental theories describing nature are totally incompatible. General relativity on the one hand does an excellent job of describing the universe at the biggest scales, while quantum mechanics is excellent at describing the smaller scales. They just don't work together, which doesn't make theoretical physicists very happy. In fact, after coming up with general relativity, Einstein spent the rest of his life trying to find a theory that would explain 
well, everything. But he was unsuccessful, as others have been since then, which leaves the community in a very uncomfortable position. Of course, nature doesn't care if physicists are uncomfortable. So why is this even a problem, as long as the two theories work in the areas they're suited for? Well, for one thing, there are places in the universe where we would need both theories to understand what's going on. One of those being inside a black hole, where the crushing force of gravity is so strong that it has to be taken into account, even on the smallest scales described by quantum theory. We just don't know how to do that. So no one can really tell you what's going on inside a black hole. To figure that out, we need a quantum theory of gravity. There are ideas for how such a theory might work, but no one can predict effects that we can go out and measure today. So who is to say that these existing ideas of how to bridge the gap between general relativity and quantum theory, who's to say that they're even right? By testing the existing theories to even higher precision, we hope to eventually uncover a crack in one of them, some prediction that isn't right, and in so doing, shine a light on where a new theory needs to go. So that's why we do high precision experiments like measuring the gravitational redshift with radio astron. In our case, we didn't find a departure from prediction, but at least we've shown that over a range of distances near Earth, any new theory must make the same prediction as general relativity to at least one part in a hundred trillion. For me, that's pretty cool, but so was following in Albert Einstein's footsteps. So that's my work in a nutshell. Very fun. And of course, um, as a special note to any listeners, if you do want to have a look at the paper, um, it is uh, free to free to read as a PDF. Um, you just have to search for gravitational redshift test of EEP with radio astron from near Earth to the distance of the moon. So I got that right, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I think you hit on all the keywords. <laughs> so if you put that in, that's the full title. That should be the full title. Um, it should pop up right away. And uh, I believe it's also in um, it's Classical and Quantum Gravity is uh, the publication. Yes, that is the and uh, so if you search for that, you can actually get into the article. Uh, beware, it, there is some fairly high level math, but it does have a very nice uh, figure three, I think, which really shows off your, um, you know, sort of uh, satellite, um, your satellite phasing, phase synchronization, uh, which I thought was, uh, was pretty fun. It, it certainly is a key part of the experiment, that whole one-way, two-way business. Um, so if anyone does feel so motivated, you now know where the full paper is. And this is actually something that I, I thought was uh, really interesting is the distances involved, actually. Uh, because as you say, there's, there's always interest in, um, in these kinds of verifications to see if we can you know, is it going to hold? Is there going to be anything unexpected or a hole poked? But if not, um, how how good is it? And at what, um, and as you mentioned, mentioned at what distance range? So 350,000 kilometers from Earth, that is uh, pretty, pretty far. I mean, that's almost, I mean, depending on, I guess, where the moon is in its orbit, um, that's that's almost out to the moon. Yeah, that's right. It's about uh, the distance that light travels in a second, right? So one of the important things about radio astron was that to be successful in observing in the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it needed to go pretty far from Earth. I mean, that was the whole point. The whole point was to have radio astron plus other observatories on Earth observing at the same time using a technique called VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, uh, effectively making a, a radio dish the size of the distance between the telescope. So by putting radio astron as far as possible, as far as we could still communicate to the spacecraft and as far as we could launch it, 
putting it in such a far orbit allowed us to have this incredibly large, effective telescope observing really small objects like the cores of really distant active galaxies. And, and uh, yeah, so well, for us, that of course was fortunate because it also allowed us to do our experiment over a, a very wide range of distances from Earth. Yeah, and it, it is worth noting that a lot of times folks do have trouble picturing just how far away, um, how far away this is, because if you if you had if you could imagine the Earth sort of shrunk down to the size of a marble that you were holding, you would have to put the Moon in your other hand and stretch it way out, <laughs> right, um, far far away um, to get to that uh, that that um, scale. So your your orbit in this case is it it's it's actually quite a long distance out compared to a lot of the other satellites that we've been talking about, um, especially you know Earth orbiting um, Earth orbiting navigation satellites and things like that uh, tend to be low Earth orbit or you know uh, well substantially closer should I say right and and even a geostationary satellite which is far as far as a communication satellite is concerned is still 10 times closer than the furthest distance that radio astron goes to um and 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 the other difference with radio astron is it's in what's called an elliptical orbit so typically when you think of communication satellites you can just picture a circular orbit so the spacecraft's just going around in a circle around the earth but with radio astron it's it's an ellipse so the Earth is kind of off to one side of the ellipse and the spacecraft goes out to the very far opposite end of the ellipse. And um, uh, that type of orbit allows or allowed because radio astron is not functioning anymore, like you mentioned, but it allowed radio astron to observe at a variety of distances. So for certain radio astronomy targets, uh, having radio astron be a little closer into Earth made sense. And for others, uh, particularly those that really wanted to look at very minute features of, of faraway galaxies, then having radio astron be further away was useful. So an elliptical orbit served both purposes. And having such an elliptical orbit, um, I know there's been some talk about uh, stability. What was, do you know um, what kind of stability they were able to get for observing during, you know, because you have such an elliptical orbit, your distance is, is always changing, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, radio Astron was able to point accurately enough uh, for the radio observations. So I don't think that was ever uh, a huge problem. But if you're talking about stability, I can take it in a different sense, which is that the orbit itself wasn't stable. And this was actually intentional. So yes. because, <laughs> because Radio Astron went out to nearly the distance of the moon, at some times it actually was close enough to the moon that the moon would change the orbit of the spacecraft. And that was deemed beneficial so that over the lifetime of the mission, Radio Astron could actually observe at a variety of different distances and in different directions. So it was actually a very, very interesting and, and unique orbit as compared to most other satellites. The advantages of instability. <laughs> Wonderful. And it's <laughs> worth noting that as well, um, we talk about, okay, well, it, it, it's um, it's not, you know, it's not working anymore, it's not responding, but it did actually still uh, go about two years longer than its planned duration. I believe it made it for seven years. Um, and at least on the, the radio Astron site, it said the original plan was five years. So again- and, and that's typical of these space missions, right? They're typically, they're over-engineered, but of course we're always happy when we get more out of a spacecraft than we planned. Now, yes. one thing that really went over though, was that hydrogen maser that was so important to our experiment, um, but that you mentioned failed in, in 2017, it yeah. actually wasn't expected to work more than a year or two. And it actually lasted five years. Ah, uh, that's so amazing. That, <laughs> yeah, it was actually quite an engineering feat uh, to create an atomic clock that is by its nature very, very delicate, but to create it in such a way that it could be launched and could survive launch. 
Actually, Radio Astron had two of them and one didn't survive launch. Uh, but fortunately, the other did and lasted until 2017. And of course, at this kind of precision, as you mentioned, I, I even forget the number of decimals involved. <laughs> um, you do actually need very, very, very high precision measurements. And um, if you folks haven't heard about an atomic clock, uh, atomic clocks are much more accurate than what you will have seen on you know, your wristwatches and things like that. Um, they actually measure time by looking usually at the resonant frequency of atoms. Uh, so atoms have different energy levels and the atomic clock actually uses the energy states in an atom um, to serve as a, you know, the basis for time. And this actually now is uh, one of the ways that we define uh, as a scientific community, the definition of a second. <laughs> Uh, when you know when you're dealing with extremely high precision, the definition of a second is uh, is pretty important. Um, so it's currently defined uh, by um, cesium and the uh, what's called a, an um, unperturbed ground state transition frequency of a cesium 133 atom. And so it's actually got a definition in terms of that particular atomic structure, um, which is, a uh, you know, it's a cool, a little bit of a cool, um, a cool tie in to your, um, you know, your spacecraft, basically. Uh, yeah, and, and, uh, you know, in the case of a hydrogen maser, uh, the transition that we use there to keep time is is actually an easy one to imagine. So if you imagine that you have a proton and you have an electron, that's what hydrogen is, right? It's just, it's the simplest atom. So you have that electron uh, whirling around the proton. It, uh, in, in the ground state, so this is in the lowest energy state, um, the intrinsic spin, so all these subatomic particles have these intrinsic properties called spin, and you can imagine it as there's a spin up and there's a spin down. And in the case of hydrogen in its lowest state, the proton is spinning in one direction and the electron is in another. But if you add just the tiniest little bit of energy, you can get them to both spin in the same direction. But if you leave them sometime later, they will emit a photon, the electron will emit a photon and they'll go back to spinning in opposite directions. And that photon, it's, it's relatively low energy. It's, uh, um, uh, it, it, if it, so if you do that in the atomic clock, you can use the, the uh, oscillating frequency of that photon to keep time. And that's what happens in a hydrogen maser. Yeah, the hydrogen maser uh, frequency is uh, pretty interesting because if you haven't uh, quite realized yet, you're listening along going, Hydrogen atoms aren't they aren't they really really small? Um, yes, actually, by looking at this atomic clock and talking about our definition of science, uh, uh, you know, and the seconds, um, how seconds can you know be defined in terms of these atoms, we actually have sort of transitioned into the quantum mechanics realm, which, um, as you as you may remember, is the one that uh, you know does have some difficulty in certain areas of black holes, for example, uh, reconciling with gravity. So in a way, we already need quantum mechanics to, uh, to get our measurements. Um, but it, it, is, um, it is pretty fun that we have these devices now, um, as you say, hydrogen maser, uh, or in the case of the, um, the uh, International Atomic Time Committee, I think, I, ITA. I forget the, I, I forget the acronym, TIA. Um, uh, but you know, uh, they they actually do use um, uh, the 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 standards of quantum mechanics and the standards of of relativity for so many things in science now because they're just so incredibly reliable. Um, so we it is very much a true puzzle in. Uh, you know, classical and quantum gravity, how can you have two systems that are so reliable and so well measured and still don't agree in some areas? So 
<laughs> and, um, and, and on a, you know, a day-to-day basis, like it, it, we use quantum uh, theory or quantum mechanics and we use general relativity together all the time. I mean, you know, GPS, GPS wouldn't work if we didn't take, well, if we didn't use the quantum side to build the clocks that are on, bo- on board the GPS satellites and we didn't use general relativity to understand the effect of time because GPS, even though we use it to determine where we are in space, it's actually all about time, but that's a whole other thing. Um, So we use these two things together at the same time all the time. But when we try and actually understand a situation like what's going on in a black hole that requires both theories to be used together, that's when things fall apart. Yes, exactly. And it is a very specific case, but it's, um, it's a true puzzler for, uh, for modern modern physics, and um, I will just say, since you since you we we had you out at the distance um, to the moon, basically from Earth. Um, since you're already at that distance, <laughs> I just have to ask: um, uh, ha- Have what are your thoughts on the proposed lunar crater radio telescope? Have you uh, have you heard about that? Uh, well, I mean, who in 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 our field of radio astronomy. I mean, who hasn't fantasized about such a thing? I mean, to take a crater on the backside of the moon that is always pointing away from Earth. So we're using the entire moon to shield all of that radio interference coming off of this planet, all of those Mm -hmm. darn communication (laughs) satellites, you know, constantly buzzing in the frequencies we want to use. So you have all of this shielding and you can take a, a, a nice uh, appropriately shaped crater and just glaze it over in, 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 well, you don't even have to glaze it, just cover it in wires so that you can form a radio dish and observe the heavens un, uh, you know, without interference. That would be quite, quite a thing, but, uh, haven't quite found the budget to do that yet. Yeah, it is still showing as proposed on the NASA website um, in, in, in selections, I believe, as a phase one, phase two, and phase three selections. Um, but uh, that was 2020, and this is now, by my watch, 2023. So <laughs> without any updates, I'm guessing it is, uh, um, it, it is on pause. But as you say, it's, it's kind of a, a really... Uh, astronomically practical idea and on this show we've talked a lot about the moon because of course we have the Artemis programs coming up we have potential water at the South Pole Um, there are a lot of really really cool reasons to go to the moon and um, and do more there but uh, this is probably one of my favorites anyways the lunar crater radio radio telescope and they have actually already mapped out a likely crater um uh and they have uh basically proposed uh, at least the nasa proposal was to use a wire wire mesh basically um to set up uh um, basically a filled aperture radio telescope um with uh with sort of four um sort of uh i guess uh holding um, devices that would that would uh, land and position themselves around the crater, which you could then fill with uh, not a fine wire mesh, but still a wire mesh. Um, and all you'd have to do is hope that nothing like you know nothing particularly large collided with it. <laughs> um, you could probably take a little bit of damage. I mean the the great thing about radio astronomy is that it's it, you know, the, the, the technology that we're u- using is a little less sensitive than yes. when observing in, uh, you know, the, the same light that we can see with our eyes, then, you know, making mirrors and things for our telescopes become quite an amazing feat of engineering. Yeah, the radio wavelength is um, more forgiving, shall I say, <laughs> than uh, than optical. And especially if you are going to put something on the moon, having it um, maybe not require very much in the way of maintenance, um, like uh, a lot of radio telescopes uh, do, uh, this would be an excellent, an excellent candidate. So, um uh, yeah, the, I believe at last at last call, I um, it was sort of 2020 when I saw them. Uh, they were making a big a big push for a radio telescope 
on the uh, on the backside of the um, of the moon, which of course would give you that long distance that you're looking for. Um, but you would still need a way to communicate with it because if you're on the backside of the moon, we have all these communication satellites. Um, some of which we discussed in our show at the start, the Anik A1, <laughs> uh, for example, um, they're all around Earth. So if you want to communicate with the back side of the moon, uh, you do actually need to make sure that you've got some sort of uh, communication satellite or lunar gateway or both uh, to stay in contact with your, with your object. You also need some way of producing electricity uh, yes. even when the sun is on the other side of the moon. Because one of the other issues, of course, is that on the moon, you have uh, about two weeks of sunlight and you have about two weeks of night. So that's also another very practical problem. Uh, I mean, wasn't it just recently that, uh, was it the Chinese mission that never woke up after two weeks of nighttime? Um... Or was that the Indian mission? In any case, just, I, just read yes, me. the the it was the um, the Indian mission was the one that went to the South Pole, and uh, that was be, that may be the one you're thinking about. Recently, there was a big race. Um, there, both the uh, the Indian Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency were both trying to send landers to the South Pole, and um, basically they uh, they were sort of racing, um, and the the Russians crashed, and the Indian uh, uh, probe did make it, but uh, it it did I believe run out of um, it did run out of energy, and that's something that you have to think about because the moon uh, it does get pretty good sunlight at its poles. But it has places that are always dark. Um, that's actually where we think a lot of the water is. <laughs> so uh, one of the fun things that has been proposed is uh, helium-3 mining on the lunar surface. But again, we don't actually know how viable that is because we've we've never done it. <laughs> so um, one helium step at a time. Yeah, he helium-3 has been has been. Um, uh, um, you know, brought back, uh, we have, we know that it's there, but, uh, um, you know, we first, we have to get back to the moon, I think, and properly, properly explore it. Anyways, <laughs> it's a little, a little bit, a little bit far away. Um, and, you know, um, once it is all set up, we could probably use your, uh, your techniques again, um, to maybe even get a, a higher precision uh, measurement for relativity. There's always hope. <laughs> it's, there is there is um, an upper limit on on the precision we can measure, but I I think it's it's uh, um, with your use of atomic clocks, it's got to be extremely extremely high. And and, uh, and of course, there's always more statistics, right? If you gather more data, uh, generally you can uh, push even even further in precision. So. You know, maybe one day we can have a mission that can go even longer than five years. Exactly. And that's, um, that's something that I always tell all of my students is more data never hurt anybody. <laughs> so um, if you get a chance to, to take more data, definitely go for it. And if you uh, if you got a chance to to follow up your most recent uh, your most recent paper here, do you have any um, favorite next steps that you're working on in this area? Well, speaking of more data, <laughs> um, the preliminary results that we published were based on frequency measurements taken uh, for, uh, you know, by a certain equipment that, uh, that was running live at the tracking station that, you know, kept its eye on the spacecraft. And those measurements aren't as precise as the raw data that we got from recording the spacecraft signal itself. So from doing that, we can in post-processing, go back and reconstruct the frequency of the spacecraft signal. And from that, uh, get even more precision uh, from the data that we got from radio astron. So right now we're in the process of doing that. Um, and so perhaps in the next year or two, we'll publish a follow-up paper with our final results that we hope will be uh, a little bit more precise. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's, uh, I, I know that um, one of the things that was mentioned is that the, um, 
there are there have been use of other satellites as well um so you know we have we have some uh exciting papers to look forward to it sounds like in this area um all right so let me go ahead and uh just uh wrap up here i think probably about time to close off the show so uh, to our guest uh nelson nunes thank you so much for coming on tonight and telling us all about this really super fun article um and i definitely encourage everyone to go out uh go out and read it it's free online uh which is you know really awesome do you have any last uh last comments you'd like to leave leave everyone with i just want to thank you for having me on and giving me a chance to talk about general relativity thank you awesome well thank you for being here and it was uh, great to have you visit our show i will have to have you back again um at the <laughs> very least for your next paper <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, you have been listening to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. Uh, the hosts this evening have been myself and Julie Tomei, and our special guest this evening was Nelson Nunes. Um, if you have any questions or would like to connect with us on uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you can find all of our links on our website, yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. Thanks for tuning in to York Universe, clear skies, and have a good night. Good night.